Today, I'm catching up with Ryan from Ryan Hogue Passive Income to talk about the best print on demand slash passive income opportunities of 2024. So you're not going to want to miss this one. We're also doing a video on Ryan's channel, which I will link down below. So make sure you subscribe to Ryan. Our last collab was about two years ago now. So it's definitely been a while. Welcome back to the channel, Ryan. Thank you, Tia. It's great catching up with you. Thank you for coming on. Um, so can you briefly introduce yourself and talk about your journey? I mean, you've probably been asked this so many times now, but just for new viewers. Sure. Yeah. The quick summary is uh, I started kind of my passive income journey in 20, late 2016, early 2017. Uh, I was previously in my past life, uh, a web developer full time that had a web development side hustle and taught web development at a uh, local university. So I, I did the complementary approach there where I took my like one skill set and monetized it in multiple ways. And I basically applied that exact same approach to making passive income that I now do full time. Um, when I got started, I, I think I spent three years really from early 2017 to 2020, uh, early 2020. So three years um, doing all of the above, you know, doing the web developer stuff and then trying to figure out how to make money online through e-commerce, uh, which led me to Amazon, to Etsy, and to, you know, all, all the major e-commerce platforms that we're familiar with. And uh, I was able to kind of work that into, you know, a successful e-com business and then started talking about it on YouTube. And it's an exciting journey, you know, who knows where we're going to be yeah, you know, this year and next definitely. year, but it's been fun. Yeah. And I definitely think it's cool how you were able to build this business while working your nine to five and then transition um, into that. Whereas, you know, a lot of people, they just think about going into this directly and just quitting their job or quitting school or whatever, which I don't think is realistic. So your story is definitely a great example of that. Um, okay. So you sell on a very large variety of platforms. I think probably the most that I've seen of anyone on YouTube. So do you mind talking about what you think is the biggest opportunity out of these, or if there's any that you think are like underrated or uns unsaturated in 2024? Yeah, for sure. So for me, I really prefer to optimize my print on demand approach for Amazon merch. Mm -hmm. uh, or Amazon merch on demand for anybody that has never heard of it before is the full name, uh, which is like an Amazon um, kind of like closed loop opportunity that you have to apply to get in. And if you're accepted, um, you basically publish designs to products that they will fulfill. And to every customer that purchases your products, it's actually sold by Amazon. So they'll never know the behind the scenes. Like I'm the guy who designed it and that's getting paid out a royalty. Um, and the fact that it's sold by Amazon, you know, it's, it's not really our brand or our customer. It's Amazon's brand and Amazon's customer, but that increases the conversion rate, which leads to more. Uh, it better improved, you know, organic ranking and leads to more sales and creates this flywheel effect. So I just love Amazon merch as an opportunity for print on demand and they're prime eligible. Everybody loves mm -hmm. their Amazon prime right around the world. Yeah. Uh, so for me, like whether it was the most optimal approach or not, the way that I've always run my business is I optimize everything for Amazon merch and then I let it trickle down to all the other platforms. And that includes like for me, you know, Etsy is probably a big number two, even though like, <laughs> Let's be real here. Like Etsy print on demand, it, it really caught fire last year. I heard Steven mm -hmm. uh, from Hello Custom say that Printify alone told him that there were like 5 million new Printify accounts opened. Most of those people were trying to sell apparel on Etsy. So it's also kind of like, oh, hey, wow. like be a little bit contrarian here. If everybody's doing that, then maybe just yeah. pivot to Walmart, right? You can, mm -hmm. you can integrate directly with Walmart and sell print on demand there. You can sell print on demand on Amazon Seller Central in addition to Amazon Merch. So why not do both? I do both. Um, right. I post my best sellers to eBay because they 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 kind of limit how many uploads you can have. You know, I have a, a yeah. pretty established eBay account from like 2006, I think. Um, so like I can list a lot of products, but it's still not like uncapped by any stretch. So I'm, I'm strategic about what I list there. And um, beyond that, I kind of think they're less important opportunities, but places like Redbubble, TeePublic, Spreadshirt still sends me a check every month, even though they get smaller and smaller. <laughs> so yeah. places like that. Yeah, that's definitely a good approach, like optimizing for one platform and then just sort of letting everything trickle down rather than trying to optimize for every single platform. About eBay, did you sign up with a, a personal account or a business account? Because I signed up to eBay with a business account and it got shut down like on the same day. I called them 
the customer service to ask why it was shut down and they just said like our systems are very smart or something like that like we can detect when there's suspicious activity so I just got completely banned off eBay without uploading anything um so yeah I was just yeah. interested to know if you've had any issues with eBay account health so I definitely did a, a personal just based on when I opened it uh so mm -hmm. long ago but um okay. the one the one thing I can think of that may be why something happened to you is like just theoretically if you used a service um that opens ll or that assists with forming llcs like i've used multiple services i've also done it manually right. with the help of other people um that yeah. knew what they're doing but like if you use like klemta who makes it so easy to open an llc like i've used them multiple times but mm -hmm. the the llcs share like a registered address basically like of an like, i don't know exactly how it works but like it's basically like the address on file the default one is most likely going to be one that other people's llcs that may be associated with fraud share and that yes it. yeah i think that is probably going to be the problem actually because um i use one of those services because i didn't want to put like make my home address public right um so that could be the problem actually yeah we've yeah. run into that in certain ways um mm -hmm. with some of the llcs we formed right yeah that's good to know um so you talked about walmart um and obviously the smaller platforms like Redbubble, T Public, which I've sold on before as well. But the reason I sort of transitioned away from them was because um, of the whole branding aspect of it. Um, are there any other opportunities that you think would be interesting? Like Fair, I think you were talking about in the email. Yeah, yeah. My uh, fiance, Marielle, like she started selling print. Well, she started selling her, you know, I would just say the FBA products, like her physical branded products that are not mm -hmm. POD um on you know amazon but then also listed them on fair and fair is more of like a b2b marketplace so like she's running a business she's selling mainly to retailers that have like physical okay. retail space um so the moqs like the minimum order quantities are high you can you, you control them but you know it's typically going to be like 10 units minimum you again you control them and when you price your stuff like they need to be able to flip them typically for like 2x as much but you can still sell pod there like you can still okay. make money selling t-shirts for 17 dollars and tell them to sell them for 35 or right. the gildan 18,000s. she sold a bunch but she's probably selling them i think she said like 22 bucks or 23 and telling people to sell them for like 45 46 50 you know and um one tip i would say is unfair and by the way, fair, you know how like we think of selling on Amazon or Etsy as like headaches, but like fair has great customer support. So does, so does uh -huh. Walmart, by the way, they, they're uh -huh. still new enough where their customer support's really good. Eventually it'll probably go yeah. and get a lot yeah, worse. It's going to happen. Yeah. But, um, just, um, what was I going to say with regards to, yeah, a niche shop, like sticking to a niche, I think can help, you know, it definitely can help your average order value. Like mm -hmm. if you're, you know, specifically to that one niche, they may click your, and it could be on Etsy too, right? They can still click your shop and go browse what you've got because if they want yeah. one thing, there could be other things that they want. Yeah, that's definitely interesting as well, like selling to retailers directly. I uh, haven't seen that before. So um, cool. Um, so with Walmart, is it, do you have to get approved first or can anybody sign up? Yeah, it's a bit like uh, the Amazon Seller Central application, but uh, you don't okay. have to jump on a video call. You know what I mean? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um mm. walmart's old application was terrible like i went through it two or three or four times and i just would never hear back and then they finally like just redid okay. the whole thing modernized it like literally like the old the old one had like web page errors where like sometimes you couldn't click the next button like it was terrible mm -hmm. um in its current state it's really good you know and and yeah. for what it's worth like you need to have a uh like i haven't reapplied in over a year right i'm only gonna apply once so but the way okay. it was was you had to have a um llc Basically, you had to have a business right. entity. So I'm assuming that's still correct. So that's worth considering. And um, once you get through, you need to apply for a uh, lag time exemption and a UPC exemption, which you can do in the help section. And once you have those two things, you can integrate with, you know, Printful or Printify and then start pushing your products and um, they get automated fulfillment. And what's not to like about that? You know, I mean, it, it really kind of scaled over time with me in 2023. So I'm excited for this year. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a really good opportunity. I'll definitely have a look into that. Um, okay, so my next question is about sort of web development and programming. And do you think that helps at all with the business that you're doing now, which is all this like passive income stuff? Like, are you able to sort of write automatic programs for things? Or do you think that it's helped you in any way? Like, are there any transferable skills? 
It's a great question. Like the one thing that I always think of is kind of at the root of my decision making is how is my time best spent as a function of the money it makes me <laughs> since it's a business. Yeah. Yeah. And I never, I just never know. Like, I think often if I'm writing code and I'm like, I'm, well, I was, I don't know. I'm not as sharp as I used to be, but I, like, I was very good at that. Like a good programmer is going to write less code as opposed to more, you know what I mean? To get the same thing yeah. done. Yeah. Um, it's about efficiency. And so I was good at it. You know what I mean? But these days it's like, if I'm ever doing that stuff, it's been for like almost like complimentary side ventures. I, mm -hmm. I had this, I met this guy who's like a good back end developer. I used to be a front end developer. So together we're like right. a super team. And yeah. we built um, I think like three Chrome extensions. Uh we we had one that was just an Amazon merch to try to flag trigger words and try to like keep your account safe. That mm -hmm. was just for fun. It was a quick, easy project. We did one where it uh hooked into Canva and Photo P. And right. you could upload a CSV of like, you know, professions, right? And then you could have your design said world's okayest and then put a variable there and it would just cycle in and out the different uh, names from your CSV. Oh, basically. that sounds so useful. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So we yeah. did like that. We did stuff like that, that like were useful and were profitable. And we ended up selling mm -hmm. that company or whatever, com not really the company, but we sold that, you know, entity within the, the LLC. Right. Um, because Canva integrated that exact functionality after a while. So yeah. it was like, oh crap, we got to get rid of this thing. Yeah. Um, and we're working on something right now for a, uh, there's an opportunity that I think is probably the best opportunity to make passive income in 2024 called Amazon influencer program. So I guess like it, you basically review Amazon products, like anything that's on Amazon. Like I have this water bottle right here that I bought on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I can review this. And then if somebody, like I do it in a video, and then if yeah. somebody watches my video on the Amazon product detail page and then buys it, I get like a small percentage, like maybe one or two or up to 3% typically uh, of their purchase price. Okay. So me and that guy are working on a Chrome extension for Amazon influencer uh, program to basically do just like a bunch of things that will assist people that are in there. You know what I mean? As somebody who's in there, my fiance is in there. Right. A bunch of people that follow me are, are in that program now. Okay. So is the Amazon influencer program different to the standard Amazon affiliate marketing? Because I know that that was a thing for a while now. Is that a new thing? It, it's different. Yeah. It's, um, okay. but at the same time, great question. Like there's like an entity ID in the top right corner. If you get yeah. into the influencer program, you, you get like a second entity in that dropdown that you can switch to. It'll always start with okay. on AMZ. So you click your on AMZ and then you'll be able to see your um, video review commissions. Right. Yeah, that's really cool. Actually, I didn't know that because I know there was always like influencers in the sense that you could click through to someone's shop. So, for example, like if you were watching a Graham Stephan video, for example, and he had like the camera that he was using and then he linked to that, you could have like he has a shop on Amazon basically of all his affiliate products. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess this is something different as well. So yeah, that's it's, really it's the same program though. It's the, same, it's the program. same program. Okay. So if you applied earlier, like I, I applied had no clue about the video review thing. Mm -hmm. I did it just to list my like, you know, recording equipment, like this microphone and my, my yeah. camera in just yeah. a single page. Cause like when I had to learn that crap, I had no clue what I was doing. This isn't my forte at all, yeah. but you know, as YouTubers, we have to figure it out. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to make other people's lives easier and just put this all in one place. So I had my account. So then what you have to do when you're in the influencer program, which requires a little bit of a social media following mm -hmm. is, um, which I mean, again, you can just purchase the followers for like a hundred bucks. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. It's like, it's an automated check. So it's not like a big mm -hmm. deal. Um, then you just literally film, like get your cell phone and film three videos okay. and just follow the rules. Like literally review a pencil or like a pair of scissors. You know what I'm saying? Just review something simple, three videos you'll get approved to earn commissions. After that, it's like the floodgates open. Just go around your house, review everything, everything, and then just upload them. Right. To, yeah, it's it's sick. I mean, uh, I got introduced to it by a YouTuber named Adam Young. He right. literally, in his sixth month, like from, from zero to six months, he made over 10K profit in his sixth month. So I was That's like, crazy. damn, you need to take it seriously. Yeah, do you know how many followers is it, is it to get approved? Yeah, I mean, it's... um I. I watched somebody else's video, honestly, so mm -hmm. I can give you what they said Credit yeah. to them. Someone named uh, Mercedes Gomez, I believe. She seemed like she was pretty confident in these in these numbers. It was like mm -hmm. 2,500 Instagram, 2,500 Facebook, 200 TikTok, mm -hmm. or 5,000 YouTube as oh, rough, wow. rough estimates. It's not too high. TikTok's easy. Yeah, it's not too high at all. Yeah. 
yeah yeah tiktok's definitely you can definitely get 200 on tiktok in a good amount of time <clears throat> yeah that's that's interesting um okay so next question is um i do think print on demand has changed a lot since we both started it um I do think that some areas of it has become more competitive, like as you said, um, people coming to Etsy with Printify and all of that. Um, so do you think your advice to beginners has changed over that time as well? Like obviously you talk about the complementary approach and just getting as many products up as possible on the platforms that are making money. But do you think there's anything specifically that has changed um, sort of over time? Yeah, another great question. And uh, for sure, like you can, I, di I didn't delete any of my old YouTube videos. So I mm -hmm. would show what was working with, for me, you know, yeah. back in like 2019. And like, it was definitely good enough back then for like, uh, on Etsy, you know how Etsy is a little bit more of, um, there's more variables to solve for, right? If I go on yeah. like Amazon, you have to have the white background image. So how much time am I going to spend on my primary thumbnail? You know, not much Yeah, exactly. on Etsy. We need to go in there, make it look really good, right? Make the listing good, get those 13 tags, 20 character limit, which I hate. Yeah. Um, and it's just so much more unforgiving now. Like you really mm -hmm. need to be like launching pristine listings because, uh, I, I just wrapped up my Etsy shop review series on YouTube after a hundred episodes. And like, there are shops that have like 10 sales, you know, with people who are beginners mm -hmm. and their shops are really good. You know what I yeah. mean? Like way better than my shop used to be when I was, you know, was pretty successful, you know? Yeah. It's definitely gotten a bit more competitive in that aspect. Um, but yeah, no, I do agree with everything having to be optimized on Etsy, whereas on Amazon, you can just, everyone, it sort of levels the playing field as well. And I feel like um, on Etsy, the social proof is becoming a lot more important because you can see the number of sales that a shop has and the number of reviews. So if you're starting out as a beginner, it's kind of hard to catch up with all those shops that have the social proof. But yeah, I think yeah, it can good, still be done as long as you find the the right niches. Yeah. And I think uh, I was going to say, I think like there's there's usually still an edge that can be had. Etsy yeah. is tough because of how Etsy's, Etsy ads work. Mm -hmm. but like Amazon, if you are willing to go just a little bit above and beyond, like most people are turned off by the word advertising. Like they don't want to hear about it and don't want to think about it because they think of it as spending money. But if you think of it yeah. as spending a percentage of your profit margin in that sale, if you think of it like that, like I'm going to spend, like I have a 30% profit margin. I'm going to spend 10% of that, you know, not 10% of the 30%, which is 3%, but like as like a flat 10%, you know what I yeah, mean? Like, yeah. so I have a 30% margin. I'm willing to give up 10% of that. So I keep 20% as an ad. And if you're willing to just do those little things, you can launch manual ad campaigns on Amazon in like three minutes or less. No joke. Like so simple. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you can spend a lot longer on them. Don't get me wrong, but like you can just do the bare minimum and target your, you know, in a phrase match and an exact match, your primary keywords and phrases and set a low bid and, Again, you just need to just remember to get back in there every few days and just make sure you're not like either wasting too much money or if they're not working, maybe just slowly level them up. I always start low and then go up rather than start high and go low. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, yeah, I think I was definitely one of those people that was a bit scared of ads. Like I just wanted to do everything SEO wise. But the thing that convinced me to do Etsy ads was just like the amount of stuff that I just buy, like clothes and stuff that I don't even need. And I just kept on thinking every time, like, what if I just spent that money on advertising instead? Um, so, yeah, I feel like it's definitely not a bad thing. You can definitely get some good, like, organic traffic as well from advertising. Yeah, and I, I know some people that, like, are serious about their credit card rewards. And, mm -hmm. um, like, that's a whole nother thing, right? Like, if yeah. you start factoring that in, it makes it, <laughs> it, make, it changes it, right? Because, like, if you, I just saw my friend Cameron at Merch Jar. He has Amazon advertising software and he literally just broke the 1000 or the $1 million royalties on Amazon Merch. But he spent, well, it's not but, I mean, he spent over $400,000 to generate that. But, like, right. his credit card rewards on almost half a million dollars in spend, when you just start, like, think about that, like, he can fly around the world, you know, a hundred oh, times wow. first class, probably, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any credit cards that you would recommend? Because I've heard the PayPal one is good, but um, I haven't used any yet. I've just been using sort of my business debit card. Yeah, I mean, I just I uh, I talked to Alec. You know, um, the you know maybe POD. be different in the US as well from the UK. Okay, yeah, so it might be different. Um, I talked to Alec, and he was just recommending that PayPal one that you just said. So I actually okay. have it. Um, 
I'm always scared to like show it, but I have it right here in front of me because I've been switching over my, my, um, trying to switch over things to that. Cause you can get up yeah. to 3% just straight cash back oh, wow. if you use okay. PayPal checkout. Yeah. So you, what you mm -hmm. do is you add it to your PayPal account, pay with PayPal checkout, but use that as the payment source. And I think it's literally, I did the math in my head. I think it's because like PayPal, which by the way, I mean, the amount I probably pay in PayPal fees, I don't want to think about. It's just like insane. They'll, they'll take like what? 4% probably on average. Oh, okay. And so like, like if I use my PayPal credit card there, uh, that means that whoever's getting the PayPal like checkout is paying mm -hmm. them 4% and then they just, they just give me 3% of it and they still keep 1%. I mean, it's insane. Right. The business model. Yeah, that is, that is quite interesting actually. Um, I should definitely try out that PayPal credit card and just credit cards in general, I think. Um, okay. Any last bits of advice that you want to share? Um, well, number one, I'm, I'm like you with the cards, but it's just something that we got to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's just leaving money on the table. So it's like, yeah, we exactly. have to do that. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, uh, I have these like little mantras in my head that help me on my journey. Cause it was like, mm -hmm. when people see like a talking head on a screen, like, oh, now I have 170,000 YouTube subscribers and stuff. And it's like, I don't feel disconnected from the old me that was like not on YouTube and was still like pushing really hard to build up these income streams and would listen to podcasts while I was in the gym, driving my car, whatever. You know what I mean? Like I, I was serious about making, like being successful. I projected future success for myself and then I followed through. So I would just say like, you know, guys, like if you're where I used to be, like literally like put in the work, like, like tell you that future you will be successful because today you is going to put in that like hard work that you don't have to do. No one's making you, but you know what I mean? Like Tia is a great example with, you know, how you, you know, are doing other things outside of YouTube and starting your e-commerce businesses. Like you also are making it work. So yeah, like the mantras that, that used to be in my head were like, make it work, you know, cause I'm literally working nine to five teaching, doing a web development side hustle and then doing e-commerce, like make it work, you know, whatever that means and learn to love it, you know, cause if it's miserable, it's not going to be fun, but like you can probably find ways to make it suck less, you know? Yeah. So that's little things like that. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Like projecting the future success, some people call it manifesting or whatever, but it's just planning out what you're going to do and then executing it. I really think there's nothing else to that. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, so some great advice from Ryan here. Definitely lots of value from this conversation and I'm sure you all got a lot of value as well. A reminder to watch the second part of the collab on Ryan's channel, which will be linked down below. Subscribe to Ryan and have a great weekend, everyone.